Okay, so shall we step back? All right, we were we uh, the last hour we were talking about um, roles, understanding roles for a, a husband and a wife, and we're going to we we looked at specific roles. We look at um, a few more scripture that describes specifically um, what the responsibilities are for those who are involved in ministry. Um, even if you are serving in church, you are part of a ministry, right? So it, it's just not, it's just, don't think this is just for maybe pastors or um, people up who come to the pulpit, but this is for all of us who are as part of serving the local church or or in involved in some form of ministry or the or the other. Okay, so not only that, I think it also definitely applies to all of us as believers. It's just not for like we said for those who are pastors or uh, the leaders, but and each one of us who are believers are also part in a ministerial team, right? In bringing about God's word. So let's look at what is it that is required of us. And this is taken from uh, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. So if you, look, you see it in Timothy as well as in Titus. And there are many things that Paul highlights that a ministry leader, the responsibilities of a ministry leader. So let's just take some time to, we'll just read it because a lot of it is, uh, is self-explanatory. Let's just take some time to read it. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. First Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 13. This is a true saying. If a man is eager to be a church leader, Sister, not audible. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's okay. Go, go ahead from where you were reading. J just tell us if you can read. You can hear now. He should be a man. Yes, sister. Now we can hear. Okay. Yeah. Who is respected by the people outside the church, so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Church helpers must also have a good character and be sincere. They must not drink too much wine or be greedy for money. They should hold to the revealed truth of the faith with a clear conscience. They should be tested first and then if they pass the test, they are to serve. Their wives also must be of good character and must not gossip. They must be sober and honest in everything. A church helper must have only one wife and be able to manage his children and family well. Those helpers who do their work will win for themselves a good standing and are able to speak boldly about their faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, thank you, Komal. So you you see the the very many things that uh, the responsibilities of a person in ministry or or a believer is right. So there are so many things. Uh, if you look at it, it says uh, you should be you should have only one wife. Be sober, self-controlled, orderly, not be a drunkard or a violent man, must not love money, must manage his own family, the children must obey him with respect, he must be one with good character, must be sincere. Um, he talks about even what the wife should be. They should be of good character, must not gossip, be sober and honest, manage his children well. So what does this all show us? Yes, one is, yes, the responsibilities that we have, but the kind of testimony and witness that 
the marriage that you have that you're able to show to others, right? So it actually talks about how, as a believer or as ministry leaders, when how you conduct yourself in your own home is a testimony in itself, okay? Um, let's look at Titus 1, 6 to 9 and Titus 2, 1 to 6. Can someone read that? Someone online can read it. Titus 1, 6 to 9, Titus 2, 1 to 6. Somebody online? Titus 1, 6 to 9. Go ahead. Go ahead. Titus 1, 6 to 9. An elder must be without fault. He must have only one wife. And his children must be believers and not have the reputation of being wild or disobedient. For since a church leader is in charge of God's work, he should be without fault. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for money. He must be hospitable and love what is good. He must be self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the message which can be trusted and, and which agrees with the doctrine. In this way, he will be able to encourage others with the true teaching and also to show the error of those who are opposed to it. Titus 2, 1 to 6. But you must teach what agrees with sound doctrine. Instruct the older men to be sober, sensible and self-controlled, to be sound in their faith, love and endurance. In the same way, instruct the older women to behave as women should, who live a holy life. They must not be slanderers or slaves to wine. They must teach what is good. In order to train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, and to be good housewives who submit themselves to their husbands so that no one will speak evil of the message that comes from God. In the same way, urge the young men to be self-controlled. Thank you, Gertrude. So even similarly, you will find uh, these, you know, what, what Paul wrote to uh, Timothy, the same thing that you do see in the book of Titus as well, of how a church leader needs to be and how you instruct, how the, uh, how the older men must instruct the younger men, how the older men should be instructed in the way that they they uh, carry out their homes and why so it is it's written in uh, verse 5 that's titus 2 verse 5 it says so that no one will speak evil of the message that comes from god so finally it's that that you out of how you live in the personal space of your home you're actually being a good testimony you're being a good witness and no one will speak evil of you they will not say oh look at their marriage or look at the way that their family is they seem to be doing everything that the world is doing so it's and and as a result it brings down the message that comes from god right so the way that we live should testify of who god is and and spe specifically so um, even for ministry leaders okay all right uh, akil back to your question now that word submit the root word submit is the same in, in all of these scriptures, whether it's Ephesians 5.21, if it is in Colossians, or if it is in James 4.7, where you said uh, submit. The root, the root word is the same. It is to be under obedience, to subdue, to be subject to. So just like you're subject, you submit to God, the similar way is what the same thing is. Reference is the same. Okay. All right. So another role of a husband and wife in marriage is the role uh, is uh, uh, is about how uh, in marriage you enjoy the God given gift of sexuality. Okay. Now we are going to be talking about this in in length uh, in another chapter, but uh, we we just want to cover a couple of points over here. So what is the role of a husband and wife? in marriage. So let's just keep the, the um, verses of 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 6, and we will look at look at that. So the, the role for a husband and wife 
uh, when it comes to sexuality is to have intimacy. It is to enjoy that intimacy. So what does scripture bring about? Let's look at verse 2. Now this is taken from the Message Bible. So it's a little bit more, the language is a little bit more contemporary for us to understand. Okay. So uh, verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, the fact, uh, what does the Bible encourage a husband and wife to really to maintain a balanced and fulfilling sexual life? Verse 2. In a world of sexual disorder. So in all the perversion that you see in the world around, where everyone or any kind of media or the kind of message that is given to you is to take control of your own sexuality and do what you feel is best. But what does scripture say? Maintain, balance, and have a fulfilling sexual life within marriage. That is what the role is as we as one in, uh, as a husband and wife enjoy sex okay it should be verse 3 it should be a place of mutuality what does that mean where both agree to satisfy one another the husband agrees to satisfy the wife the wife agrees to satisfy the other okay it is also verse 4 it is um, an opportunity to really enjoy this gift that God has given rather than holding it back as a weapon. Often sex is used as a, uh, as a weapon, right? Maybe when you're angry with your spouse, it's used as a weapon to not engage in that intimacy. But scripture is very clear. It, is, it should be used to enjoy the gift that God's given, which is, which is also the body. Uh, it's also verse... Five, to abstain from sex um, for a period of time. And this is only for a short period of time during fasting and during praying. And the last one, to know that the devil uses uh, especially this area of life to bring people to sin. So when one does enjoy a fulfilling sex life with their uh, spouse, they are, you know, they form that guardrail around them in order to keep themselves away from uh, temptations that Satan brings. Okay, So that's the role of a husband and wife when it comes to sexuality. Okay, The last part we are going to be, not last part, the second last part we are going to be looking at is Proverbs 31. Now what is Proverbs 31 generally highlighted for? For women to be The virtuous, virtuous. woman, right? Yeah, that is what everyone wants, a Proverbs 31 wife. But did you know that the Proverbs 31 wife also has a Proverbs 31 husband? No? Okay, so let's let's look at it. Now, Blessy, let's look at it. John. Okay, we're going to look at where does it say that the Proverbs 31... If the Proverbs 31 wife has to become that, there has to be a Proverbs 31 husband, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what does it state? Let's see. Verse 11. John, read that, John. Her husband puts his confidence in her. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Read, read, read. Read, read. We will read. Her husband puts his confidence in her and he will never be poor. So what does the husband do? He has to, the Proverbs 31 husband has to put his confidence in the Proverbs 31 wife. Yes. And, and lack, yes, right? So so that is that is your responsibility as a husband. Okay, let's look at verse 23. Her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens. So what is his husband doing? Huh? Come again? How to take decisions. Is that what you said? How to lead citizens. So he's not being a lazy slob and sitting at home, is he? He shouldn't be, right? He is out in the, verse 23 says, it's well known and he's one of the leading citizens. That means he's really worked hard to become that leading citizen. So he's taken a whole lot of responsibility uh, to take care of himself, his family, all of that. So that's what a husband 
is okay verse 28 her children show their appreciation and her husband praises her so what should the husband do praise appreciate so when the husband praises who else will praise the children will praise right if the husband doesn't praise the children also won't find the need to do that so the the proverbs 31 husband is a is a real man okay uh, verse 20 31 give her credit for all she does she deserves the respect of everyone okay so this is all about what the man husband should do give her credit and because she is worthy of respect all right so the next time you think you want a proverbs 31 wife look and see if you will be the proverbs 31 husband 11 23 28 it's there down 28 31 yeah okay all right okay now uh, there's an interesting um, uh, you know, yeah, you have some question? What about the burnt dosa? <laughs> Politely, you take it and <laughs> what do you do with the burnt dosa? <laughs> okay, so we will eat it together, darling wife. Okay. All right. So there's an interesting um, uh, part in the application, which is a, which is a nice thing to do. Uh, it, it is, it's about the love languages, the five love languages. Okay, this was written in the book by Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages, where he describes how people generally express love. Okay, and through the research that he's done, he, he wrote of five ways people express and feel love. And the, these five things are words of affirmation what is words of affirmation assurance or when you say something that is encouraging that will uplift that will build uh, a person right the words that really build the person and themselves so that's words of affirmation the second one is receiving gifts what is receiving gifts what is receiving gifts Ah, gifts. I give you a pen, I give you uh, this thing. Some people feel love by giving gifts or receiving gifts, right? Okay. The third one is acts of service. Acts of service is when you do something for the other person. Maybe you cook a meal, you iron their clothes, you keep the bathroom clean, you keep the bed tidy. Those are acts of service, all right? The fourth one is quality time when you're spending enough of time with the person. And the last one is physical touch. That is the, the, the warmth that someone feels when there is uh, a, a connect, a physical touch. Okay, Not just sexual, it can also be non-sexual kind of love. All right. So these five things that uh, Gary Chapman spoke about, he, um, you know, there is a, there is a, uh, what do you say? There is an there is a questionnaire. There's a questionnaire that you can try and see uh, to see what is your dominant um, uh, love language. Okay, it shows what can be your dominant love language. And why is this some? Why is this important to know? What do you think? Yeah. So, correct. Your love languages may be very, very different from each other. So what, what generally happens? How do you love, the, uh, love another person? By the way, you feel loved, right? So one of my biggest love languages is acts of service. So when someone does something for me, I feel very, very loved. And so that is also what I'm trying to do to the other. But does that sometimes reach the other person? Maybe not. Why? Because they have a different love language. So I need, especially in marriage, I need to determine what is my spouse's love language and love my spouse the way that they feel loved, not that the way that I feel loved. 
but they love me the way that I feel loved and not in the way that they feel loved. And that's when you begin to come a little bit more closer in expressing that love to one another. Okay? All right? Vimal? Vimal got lost. Okay? So, so it'll be interesting if you can actually take some time to do that uh, assessment because it'll help you see right now what your love languages are. And it may change, but that's okay. You can revisit it when you're getting married also. All right? Another part of role and responsibility is also how you do the practical things of life. What are some practical daily things of life that we need to do? Huh, in reference to marriage and family. Work, sweeping, mopping, yes. Cooking, cleaning. Huh? Spend quality time. Spending quality time. Okay, we're talking about tasks uh, at home. Ironing clothes. You were saying something. So good. All other things, right? Now, these are equal practical roles, uh, responsibilities that is needed, right? It is not going to get done by itself. Will the broom take itself and sweep the house, right? Or the vessels will not begin to cook food for you magically. It has to be done. And someone takes that responsibility and that role. So, who takes those responsibilities? Both. Both. All right answers. Uh, how how does that? How do you decide that that both do it? Sharing in everything that your partner does. Okay, that is the way to go. Okay, how many of us will do it? Yes, Nelson? Okay, Nelson is confident. Yes, Nelson. Okay, so there are, if you look at that um, chapter 50, I'm sorry, page 52, it talks about different kinds of tasks that is needed in a home, right? It's uh, and 50, uh, maybe it's a little 48, uh, sorry, okay, my book is the old one. So it says prayer and devotion, earning for the family, managing finances, paying bills, cooking, keeping the home clean, laundry, ironing clothes, grocery shopping, ma uh, vehicle maintenance, children in the faith, overseeing the studies and activities, other things, budgeting, maintaining other relationships, driving, ensuring that everyone has their medical checkups. All of these are responsibilities, right? And to really, and if you look at that table, uh, it's a discussion that we get couples to do, to really discuss and see who's going to take the lead on that. Right? So it's an important conversation to have, because you may come from a home where maybe one fam where, where maybe both your parents divide work and do it, but maybe your spouse comes from a home where just one parent is doing all of it. And so when each person comes from these settings, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mismatch because one is expecting uh, she will do it. The other is expecting, no, he will help me with everything. And then becomes the conflict, comes the problems. Okay? So actually talking about it, coming to an agreement and a conversation about it. Remember, there's nothing wrong in doing regular household work. Nothing wrong. Okay, remember, we have to go manage mansions. One day. When? When are we going to manage a mansion? Huh? After the second coming, you're going to manage a mansion. Right? So we are all growing in character for that time. Yeah? Okay? All right. Okay. Uh, yes. Any questions now? I'm open to questions.
Yeah. So asking on neutral stand ground, uh, all these questions are really lucrative and nice to answer um, in the classroom. Okay, but uh, in most Christian, uh, leave, leave, let us say the uh, uh, non-Christian homes. But in most Christian homes, why are these things really not, uh, you know, visibly seen? Because um, uh, if you really look at it, the recent uh, APC we had this uh, uh, thing for the married couples. Oh. And thing, so with Pastor C A Benjamin and with yeah. me. So if something like that is like you know uh, organized on a frequent basis, do you think the awareness will improve? And second thing, uh, it's just like uh, you know it's like taken for granted in most houses. Uh, thing so, where this has to be addressed at the inception, or is it somewhere gradually? Or people are ready for marriage for everything else, but for the actual life ahead. So mm. just mm. your opinion, man. I, I completely agree. In fact, I think there's, uh, at, at least from the, uh, you know, the, through the pool of people I've seen in marriages, I see Christian marriages do not live up to this. And in fact, people outside of a Christian home actually do help and support one another as against. It, it is actually very sad. It's really, really sad that we have the knowledge but we do not we do not we're not obedient to it okay so yeah so what could what could be some of the reasons what do you all think uh, this is open to the class so I, i'm sure you heard uh, akil's question so where is this where should this be addressed if there's so much of a mismatch in christian homes but this doesn't actually practically is not lived out in homes where should we make the change? What are your Pre thoughts? Premarital counseling for the children who are getting married, sister. Okay, premarital counseling yeah, for the them and uh, how to go about correct and, uh, yeah. helping them. Perfect. Out. Yeah, that's that is one way that really helps because I've seen I've uh, you know when we we've, we've done the premarital sessions, uh, a lot of this comes out where where one of the spouses saying you know in this is I expect equal distribution of work and but then the other spouse may say you know this is not how I saw it my mother did everything for me right and and that uh, becomes a huge uh, conflict and so actually talking about it and coming to discussing of what should be done so yes that's one excellent way any other follow-up counseling yeah, so I've I've seen that you know, uh, marriage groups, like let's say like a life group, you have groups, life groups that completely focus just on marriage, where there are maybe five six couples together accountable to one another. Right. So uh, every husband is accountable to the other husbands, of whether or the wives are accountable to the other wives. So there is they're living a family life together in a life group and then they're going back individually to live you know there and but then this group is there like a system of support a system of guide that can help to correct and encourage that i've seen is a is a wonderful way to okay anything else i think a change of heart isn't it yeah a change of perspective that yeah, it, and I think that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of a man or a woman. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Elson? Okay, anyone else? Any other contributions from the online group? The first class, the online group was in full swing. After that, everyone just uh, toned down, died down. What happened? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, yes, Viman. Sometimes fight happens because of the their relatives, because they have uh, their relatives and she have her relatives. Oh. So because of uh, re uh, relatives, 
fights happen so what we can do you're saying because of the interference of the relatives yeah so means they they are together but because of the relationships uh, sometimes fight happened okay so you're saying the husband and the wife are together but the relatives are fighting relatives are uh, because of the relatives because she loves her ah yeah mom side and yeah okay okay so they th they are fighting you're saying is that what you're saying no should i tell in hindi ah tell me in hindi mam uh, jo parents hote hain ah. uh, ek husband ke parents aur jo wife ke parents so kabhi kabhar jhagda hota hai unki wajah se ki matlab tune mere mummy papa ko nahi samjha ya हम उन्हों उस उसकी गलती थी ये था वो था तो how we can handle that okay so what does that show you is that there is um, uh, unhealthy dependence on the parents the girl has an unhealthy dependence on the her her relatives the boy may have an unhealthy dependence on his relatives yes so much so that they have not cut off healthily from their own relations and join together as the word says leave and cleave right leave and come together when that doesn't happen these issues tend to become very very huge it becomes very sensitive because they're still very very attached to their own families and not broken away healthily to create this new uh uh this relationship and that's why it's always recommended that after marriage you take time to at least for a brief moment to to try and separate from your parents so that you'll live together learn how to handle situations on your own correct yeah they have a say or they will interfere in things of the family so to in order to do that is why it is recommended sometimes i understand it may not be possible like in my home it wasn't possible it wasn't possible for us to stay away so we did stay with my my parents with uh, my husband's parents but to to keep that boundary will take a lot more of conscious effort and you know wisdom to keep that boundary to keep the arguments or the the decisions within the setting of the husband and wife and not really pulling your parents or your in-laws into that so that takes a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding so when you actually do separate and move from your own home uh, you know every day you you have to figure out if there is no water both of you have to figure out where is the water or if there is something is broken in the home you are deciding to it but when there is a family that's involved it's always okay my parents will take care of it whereas the other spouse is saying you know why can't you take care of it so you know those kind of situations can happen so the wisdom behind it is to cleave to one another and work out situations together and keep away those interferences okay all right sister no other question ha huh, yes uh, what in case of family is where the, the one person is saved and the other is not saved how do they it means it will be a problem when they interact with each other keeping their things and all how do you overcome that like yeah i i followed if they're not one is a believer one is not a believer but what challenge are you talking about in keeping the things in front of them where it means uh, where they don't agree like the way we respond will be different from what their response will be like yeah correct so uh so i think it's important especially when you know there is a uh there is there is this kind of uh, of of a of a spiritual uh, difference between a husband and a wife uh it's important you know continue being submissive to the husband in the lord yes, in the yes. lord okay yes. so that is that is an important thing so maybe things that matter to one spiritual growth uh is something maybe that you can uh open up in communication with and uh, uh you know try and gently and to discuss that uh so whatever 
whatever you know that is in complete violation of what God expects of you, uh, your priority is the Lord. Your priority is to stand uh, for the Lord. In, sit in other situations, um, where there could be like these differences, submission is the way to go. Because mm -hmm. through your submission, you're also um, inviting your spouse to see what it means to live in the kingdom principles of a marriage. The, the other thing also is, sorry, I had another point which skipped my mind. Um, ah, so what, is, what does the Bible say? It says, uh, you know, when you are a person who believes in the Lord Jesus, you're also, and you have an unbelieving spouse, you also are a, a part in being uh, you sanctify your unbelieving spouse. Okay, so in and also in the way that you respond, in meekness, in gentleness, in kindness, in love, there is that place where you are building. You know, your your home is a holy home because of the presence of your faith and your belief that that you sanctify the unbelieving spouse. Okay, so doing things that God. Uh, has asked of you in the Lord. Again, that is a very, very clear instruction to do things as unto the Lord, to submit as unto the Lord. Okay, okay, sister. Okay. Thank you, sister. Sister, right. I have also seen where they yeah. go, means where they go, when the other person goes in line with the scriptures of God, and that is totally a submissive one. And uh, where the other, uh, where the spouse may feel that he is uh, won the battle, like or he has been dominated over the situation, he is of something else, like means take advantage of the situation. Okay. All right. So, uh, are you bringing about an observation, or you're asking me yeah, a question? Observation. observation, observation, which have yeah I've seen that you have seen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it is to, as as scripture says, it is to. Um, bring them in love, it's to bring them in love and to be able to, um, you know, stand in prayer, stand in confession of God's word over their lives and see the changes that God will bring as a result of what, okay. of, of that prayer and that confession. Okay, okay, sister. Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am, whom should we give priority to parents or to wife what do you think vimal the question is whom should we give priority to to the parents or to the wife obviously wife diksha says okay wife oh, just came one month <laughs> So she will have to wait 25 years to become more important. Huh? Okay, John had a question, I had an answer. Okay, so uh, we're not putting parents aside. Okay, so what does scripture say? And, and I think we, we looked at it in the first uh, chapter. We said, what is marriage? A husband uh -uh, leaves his home and cleaves and becomes one flesh. So what does leave mean? So, uh, okay, I think it's very difficult for people to say, when you say leave my parents, does it mean I leave them, abandon them, they are no more? That's not what it means. Your leaving does not mean physical leaving. It is, it is an emotional leaving. That is, these many years that you, like you said, 25 years you grew up with them, they were your support, they helped you, all of that they did, right? And they have become your emotional support, right? But when you get married, 
your emotional support shifts from your parents to that of your wife. It should begin to build there. Right? Because if that doesn't happen, you're married to your parents. Right? Because anything that goes wrong, who will you go back to? Your parents. So scripture brings wisdom and says, leave it is to emotionally uh, disconnect. And again, when we say disconnect, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't get support or support them. It's like, if you remember the first thing that I said, it was healthy connection, healthy separation. And I am more connected and separate, uh, uh, connected here. So how does that look? You have to make an important decision. All this while you would have got support and help from your parents. Now you know that there is your wife who is there with you, and she is the one who you need to talk to. So it starts here. You discuss it, you talk about it, you come to a decision. It's perfectly OK to get understanding from your parents. But finally, the, the focus of the relationship should be with you and your wife. That doesn't mean you don't take care and support and help your parents. You should, but your priority is your wife and your family. I want you to think of this, Vimal. Suppose your father said, my mother is the best, his mother. And he didn't take decisions from your mother. What would be in the house? Right? It's because your father and mother have chose to be together is why you feel stable in the house. Right? Isn't it? So similarly, you are creating a stable home when you are uh, uh, interdependent on your wife. Does that make sense? Convinced of the answer? Yeah? OK. <laughs> All right. Any other question? If not, we can. Sister, we can I have a question. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what if the parents are dependent on you, like single mother or father, who have no one to take care, and you are the sole uh, person, and mm. they live with you, and this causes friction in your home? Mm. Mm. How so, to deal with that situation? Yeah. So, th so that is a pretty common situation where uh, a, a widowed parent uh, may be may be with you, OK? Uh, and uh, if they have no other place or no other uh, space to go, uh, it, it is a right thing, a wise thing to keep, to have them stay with you. However, it is the role of the husband and the wife to ensure they build their um, relationship without the interference of maybe the mother-in-law or the mother. That comes from the husband and the wife. Where whenever they're, like, for example, um, you know, maybe the mother-in-law uh, doesn't permit the wife to go out with her son. So maybe at that point of time, it's too good to, sometimes good to understand why they're coming from that space but also to have conversations and say, or, uh, you know, bring about probably the husband, the son can, you know, in a loving manner, discuss how it may be important for them to do things uh, alone or how, you know, so, so when you're able to strike a good balance right from the beginning, in a way that is respectful, in a way that is loving, in a way that is loving, it can cause certain friction, I see that, but when mm. you do put forth your thoughts, your ideas in a way that that is done right from the beginning, I think everyone gets used to it. And also the wife in this case, being loving and understanding of the mother, right? Maybe there are a lot of things that the mother may be going through with the loss of her husband or you know just being alone. And establishing that relationship of togetherness at some times, but also having those personal spaces is an important thing to begin 
uh, to live out right from the beginning, right? So uh, I know it's it's a tricky situation, but with a with open communication, with keeping in line with God's word, some of these things are possible. And of course, doing it all in prayer, doing it all, asking the Lord for change for 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 a for a heart of love for everyone involved in it is something that we need to pursue okay sister thank you okay all right i think we'll close um and uh, so what is your homework for this week sorry practical ways of Ah, you could do the that also. The practical ways of how you are going to show out your roles and responsibilities as a, maybe as a man or as a woman. Okay, that's your homework. Okay, so next week, I hope there'll be at least twenty-five percent of people who do that. Okay, all right. Shall we pray? Can someone close with a word of prayer? Anybody? Someone from the from the online group can close with a word of prayer. Sister, shall I? Yes, go ahead, Lucy. Go ahead. Thank you, Father God, for teaching us your word with regard to the institute of marriage, where we have to correct ourselves and go ahead with your with your word of knowledge in our lives, O oh Master Lord. Guide us, O oh Master Lord, so that your word will be sealed in our hearts and minds to implement in our lives, O oh Father God. In Jesus' mighty holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, everybody. See you all next week. God bless.